Um, I can just push the button.
start to notice about the urban landscape, the cities around you, is they'll start to have these things called maker spaces. These are sort of shared laboratories where you can find things like 3D printers and laser cutters, um, tools that you can use to, to make new things. And um, so the, the purpose of the maker movement is to invent fabulous, new, useful things, um, sort of like this. Um, more seriously, you can find you can actually you can actually make very useful lab equipment um, with uh, using the knowledge and uh, resources that are part of the maker movement. So here's a few more items that some of you might find useful in your research someday. And um, these aren't new; these are these aren't new inventions really, but they're a lot cheaper, a lot less expensive than um, buying it from a, a commercial entity. So one thing that most of these devices have in common, the pipetter is kind of an exception, it's not an electronic device, but most electronic devices have this sort of similar structure, this similar architecture, where you, have, you might have a battery or some sort of power source and a regulator to, to maintain that power source. Um, you might have some memory if you want to store, store data. You will probably have some sensors that are detecting whatever it is in the world that um, you're interested in. And it's all, it's all brought together with this uh, with a microcontroller in the middle. So if you can learn how to program and manipulate these microcontrollers, you can basically make any simple gadget, any sort of thing that involves sensors, memory, power supplies, etc. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today is 
is what, what my lab does is we take this sort of general design and we make gadgets. We make things that could be useful for field biologists. So um, one thing you'll see is a lot of what we do are, is about logging data, collecting data, and storing it. And so you can find this whole array of different types of sensors um, on various vendors. I, I assume you can get most of these things in Brazil as easily as you can in the United States. And most of them are pretty cheap, unless you want to detect carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is very expensive to detect, I'm sorry. Um, but just about all of these sensors, any, any of these things that you want to detect in your environment is pretty easy to do. Um, once you have a design and you've, you've, you've taken a little time to learn how to, to make some of these things, you can have a lot of your assembly done very cheaply. So what we do in my lab is we get this part of the assembly done in China. So we, we make the design, we figure out what parts we need, and then we put them all together. Um, the final steps are done by my workforce, which is my, these are my two kids. Um, they do okay work, but they're, they're really cheap. And, uh, and so we make a lot of the sensors and data loggers and things uh, in, in our lab, or at least they, we, do the, we do the manual labor in our lab. That makes it much less expensive than buying from commercial sources. So what I'm going to talk about today are three, three types of gadgets that um, are already in use. These are these three uh, geolocators, RFID readers, and moon watchers. Um, you know, go to the Luna. These are three things that we're already using to collect data um, and do studies in field biology. And then I'll briefly mention a couple of other devices that we're not quite ready yet. We're working on them, but these are the things that um, we hope will come from our lab. In the, in the next year or so. So first of all, I'll talk a little bit about geolocation data loggers. I don't have a good Spanish translation for this, but these are tiny devices that you can put on a, on a bird, on a migratory bird, and they allow you to, to recreate a bird's migration after you get the data logger back, which is a, a tricky part. You have to catch the bird, put the data logger on it, let the bird go, wait a year, catch the bird again, and then you can, you can get the data to recreate the track. They're very simple data loggers. All they do is record light levels. So this is a light sensor. It detects how much light there's in the bird's environment. And um, what it allows you to do is to create profiles like this. So this, is a, this top graph is 24, a 24 hour day. And it's dark and here in the beginning, that's nighttime. The light levels increase and they're high all day long and then they drop back down for the next nighttime period. So what you can do with those data is you can, you can uh, measure the duration of the day, how long the sun is up. You can also measure the time of solar noon when the sun is supposedly directly overhead. It's just the midpoint between sunrise and sunset. And so from those two simple things, you can calculate the, the latitude of that for that day, and you can calculate the longitude in that day. Does that make sense? It's sometimes, sometimes difficult to explain. But um, so for every day that the bird has this data logger, you can get a rough estimate of the bird's location. Now, if it's cloudy, or if the bird's on the side of a mountain, or if there's a big tree, it can mess you up. So this is not accurate, highly accurate locations, but it can give you a general sense of what continent the bird is going to, um, what region of the bird the bird's going to. So um, I've got several different projects going on that involve tracking birds with these, but I'll tell you about one that's pertinent to South America. So I'm working with a colleague in Argentina um, uh, Ignacio Arita, or Nacho Arita, he um, and I are studying this species. This is, this is called a cliff swallow. Um, it is a species, I'll start here. It's a species that has, this is its breeding range up here in, in North America, and down here in South America is its non-breeding range. But a few years ago, in 2015, a small group of these birds started breeding here in Villa Maria, 
in South America. These birds are breeding here now, and they're migrating north for the austral winter, meaning they've completely flipped. I told you I'd do it. He's Italian. Flipped their <laughs> migration schedule, their migration around. They're no longer breeding in, in the north and migrating to the south. They're breeding in the south and migrating to the north. They become austral, what we call austral migrants. Um, they're not the first species to do this. So in about 1980, there was another species, Geotilodon harundo, or barn swallow, that did the same thing. They switched. But um, nobody was there to study them in the 1980s. So it was several years later. In fact, it was um, over 30 years later, we finally collected some tracking data on these barn swallows. And it indicates that they, they migrate entirely within South America. They don't even go to North America anymore. So these, these birds have adopted South America as their, as their um, continent, as their, their continental home, so to speak. But we wanted to figure out what was going on with the other species, with, with the cliff swallows. So in, in 2015, we started tracking some of these birds. So here's, here's some of our efforts to put tags on these birds. Um, they nest on bridges. So here's a bridge. Here's a river with lots of fast water going underneath it. It's really hard, it was really hard to catch these birds, um, but we did it. Um, we, put some, we put some tags on them. This is what their nests look like. They nest in, little, in these little mud nests that they put up under the bridge. Um, and here's what we got. We got three, we only got three tracks. Only got, because you have to catch the bird, let the bird go, recapture it again. So we only got three. There's only about 12 or 12 or 13 birds in the whole population that are doing this right now. So we didn't want to push them too hard. So we have three birds. It's not a big sample size, but it's a really interesting group of samples. So this looks like a big jumble. Um, the blue is one bird. The green line is another bird. And the orange line is a third bird. The blue bird is a, a, a female that went all the way up to North America. In fact, that, that point is in Oklahoma, which is my state. So I, I saw this analysis, and I looked out the window, and I was like, where's the bird? Um, <laughs> which, was, which was ridiculous, but I, I really did do that. Um, and then the green bird migrated to uh, sort of central Mexico. That's about as far south as the breeding, the normal breeding uh, range goes. So that was an interesting location. And then the third bird stayed in South America. So it, it went to Venezuela, Colombia, and uh, spent the winter there. So um, like I said, these aren't really accurate look, uh, tracks, but we're pretty sure that they're doing, these three birds are doing very different things. And I'm not sure what to make of that. I think that the birds are also not sure what to make of it. They're trying to figure out what this new life history is all about. They, um, some of these birds were, these birds that are doing this migration were actually, must have been born in uh, North America. So they've done this all in one generation. They've completely switched their migration. They probably have to switch how they molt their feathers because that has to fit into their annual cycle as well. So the birds are trying to figure it out. They don't know what they're doing yet. And it's really interesting to catch them in this early stage and see this much this, this much variation in just three, just three tracks. So um, we're still studying these species. That's one of the reasons I'm here in South America for a few months, is so I can go back to this little town, Via Maria, catch some of these birds again, deploy some more geolocators, and try to figure out what they're doing with their molt, how that works into their annual cycle, how they replace their feathers, um, whether, the, whether the, um, the migration is going to change over time, um, it could be that, that these birds will switch to being entirely South American migrants like the, like the barn swallows, we don't know. Uh, and, we're, and it's also concerned whether this population is even going to persist. We don't have that many um, pairs of birds breeding. So we want to study them, but we also want to be very careful not to, not to dissuade them from, from uh, breeding. So that's one gadget. That's the, that's the geolocators. Um, I'm going to switch to a different type gadget now, and these are, this is what we call RFID. In English, it's radio frequency identification. Um, if you've ever gone to a music store and stolen a CD, you guys are too young for CDs, 
but um, we used to have CDs at music stores. If you ever steal a music CD and the alarm goes off, that's because they are, there's an RFID tag in that CD and it's alerting the alarm system. that Something has passed through the antenna, this is the antenna for this particular reader. And so we use the same sort of technology for studying birds and I, I'm a bird person but you can also use this for mammals or, or reptiles or fish or whatever. Um, so RFID involves a, a reader, an RFID reader. This is the thing that can detect the tags. And RFID tags, which can be very small. So this is an RFID tag on a, on a very small bird, a chickadee. This bird weighs 10 grams. So you can carry this. The tag is uh, about the size of a ray rise, very small. So it's, it's good for studying small birds. The bad thing about RFID readers is that they, they're typically very short range. It's only a few centimeters um, that, 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 that you have for range. So you can't use them to study long distance movements, but you can, you can use them to study birds' um, attendance at a nest box, or at a bird feeder, or at a flower, something like that. So they're good for studying animals, animals' behavior. So I'm gonna talk about one project that uses these RFID readers. This is probably my, my best example, and this involves the collaboration with, um, with this guy, Vladimir Provosadov, who is a, uh, who works at the uh, University of, uh, of Nevada in uh, Reno, Nevada, and is one of his students in Sonnenberg. So they study these chickadees, these small birds, that live here in the Sierra, Sierra Madre Mountains, Sierra Nevada Mountains. So, these are tiny birds, they're only 10 grams, but they stay in the Sierra Nevada mountains for the whole winter. One thing about the Sierra Nevada mountains is it's one of the, it has one of the greatest amounts of snowfall in the entire world. So you can have you know, one or two meters of snow in a single day. You can have up to 12 meters of snow in a, in a single winter accumulated. So when it snows like this, they can't, they can't forage on the ground for food. What they do is they, they hide seeds all, in, or during the late summer and fall, they, they take seeds and hide them in the trees. They cache food. And so they rely on those caches, those, that cache food, to survive these really harsh winters. So there's actually two groups of mountain chickadees that, um, that this research group studies. One group, of, one group is up in the high elevations. And they have a lot of snow up there, and the, and the caches are extremely important. The food caching is extremely important. There's also a group that uses the, the lower elevations. And they, the caches are also important there, but not as important. So there's not quite as much snow. There's still some, some ground foraging that can happen. So, um, so this group is interested in studying this spatial memory. How do they remember where all these food caches are? They have to cache thousands and thousands and thousands of seeds. They have a brain that's about this big. So how do they, how, how do they recall where all that food is? So they're interested in studying spatial memory. So what they've done is they've devised these specialized bird feeders, which have RFID readers built into them. And they use these bird feeders to assess spatial memory. So I'll, I'll walk you through how this works. First I'll just say, so this is the perch where the bird lands. Um, bird lands here and there's an antenna on the perch. The birds wear uh, rings, they wear RFID tags on their legs. And uh, this is a little door that can open and close so the bird can access food like that. So there's a RFID tag, antenna's here, and this door goes up and down to provide access to food. And the food is just sunflower seeds, small seeds. So they use an array of eight of these bird feeders, eight of these automated bird feeders, um, they're put on a big, a big aluminum square, excuse me, and they hoist them up in the air on cables. The reason they do that, they have to hoist them up like this, is because there are bears. So there are bears in this area, and the bears will just tear everything apart to get to those seeds. So they have to work really hard to get these, get these devices uh, safe from the bears. But once they do this, they have this array of eight feeders, which you, could, you can visualize like this. So the way these, these tests usually start is there's some training. They basically just leave all the bird feeders open and the birds learn to come and take the seeds 
and then they then they make it so the feeders will open, the, 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 the doors will work for any bird, and they keep coming and getting seeds. And then at some point, they make it so there, for each bird, there's only one correct feeder. So feeder number, for a particular bird, only feeder number six will work. If it goes to feeder number four, nothing happens. It logs the data. We know that the bird made an attempt, but it won't give the bird any food. If it goes to eight, it won't work, but we know that the bird made that attempt. So what we can look, we can look at the sequence of decisions that this bird made. So we can say it was a seven, and that was wrong, and a two, and five, and two, and it's wrong. And then it was a six, and it got it right, and it got rewarded. And then a couple of wrong choices, and, and then it's, it's, at some point, they catch on. They realize that this is the feeder that works. And so you can look at how quickly they learn the correct feeder and use that to assess sort of their cognitive ability. So um, then you can, once you have that working, you can start doing other things. So you can, you can take the, you can set the feeder up, let them learn who the correct, which, which feeder is correct, and then just take the whole thing away for a week or whatever, 10 days, put it back out, and see if they can remember where the correct feeder is. How fast is it? How fast do they realize that this is still the correct bird feeder? So you can use that to test sort of their longer term spatial memory. Another thing you can do is you can look at cognitive flexibility. So how quickly can they learn the location of a different correct feeder? So you put the feeders out, you have one correct feeder for each bird, then you switch it. So now this other feeder is the correct one, and you can see how many times does it fail before it finally realizes that this new feeder is the one that rewards it. So they've been doing this for about three years now, and they've, they've found some pretty interesting results. So one thing they do is you, you can set these up at the high elevations and the low elevations and see if there are differences in those populations. And they see if they have a high elevation, there's better memory. The, 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 they're better able to, to go to that correct feeder after it's been removed for a while. But they have poor flexibility, so there's less co uh, cognitive flexibility. If you switch the, if you switch the correct feeder, they don't find it as quickly. They don't realize it as quickly. So they're more they're more rigid, sort of in their in their thinking. And they've also found that memory equates to fitness. So the birds that have better memory actually also have more offspring and live longer. So they monitor this population pretty closely and keep track of all the birds' histories. And so better memory is just better birds, at least in the high altitude. In the lower altitude, there's less spatial memory, as you might expect, but they have better flexibility. They're more able to adapt to a change in the location of their resource, which might make sense if their snow is melting and going into different levels and things like that. Um, and, but there's no correlation between memory and fitness there. So there is some variation in memory, but it doesn't equate to fitness in the lower altitude. So the high altitude, the, the good males, or the good, uh, the good memory, is important. Another thing they found is that spatial memory is heritable. So they look at the offspring. They've been able to look across generations now and see that um, uh, parents that have good memory tend to have offspring that have better memories. And they've also found that the females will invest more in eggs when they have a male that's got a good memory. So the way we phrase this in the title of the paper, smart is the new sexy. So the smart males get more reproductive effort from their females. And right now, they're starting to, do, they're starting to move on to the next phase of this, which is social learning. So it could be that some of these birds are actually learning by observing others uh, using the feeders. So we can manipulate which feeders reward which birds and, and, um, and, and see if uh, social learning is playing a role. In, uh, in, this, uh, in these populations. So that's all over there in, up in North America. Um, I, I, here in uh, South America, I started uh, collaborating with, uh, with Gabriela Nunez and Leandro Machi on studying um, these birds. These are, these are um, white fronted woodpeckers or carpinteros uh, de los cardones. Um, we're going to try to put RFID readers on their nests, which are on these really um, inhospitable cactuses. I'm a little worried about you know, getting an antenna up there on this cactus, but um, we think we can do it. Um, 
we just need a very good ladder and someone braver than me to go to go up there and do that. So you can, you can use these RFID readers in other contexts as well, not just in not just in the cold, snowy mountains, but also in the, in the deserts. Okay, so the last thing, the, or, or the, the, the third gadget that we're, we're currently using right now is what we call the Moon Watcher. We use it for this, this, this method called Moon Watching. Um, basically what you do with Moon Watching is you use the moon as a backdrop to, to, to visualize and count migratory birds. So la luna es un, es un, un fondo para contar los so, so, this is actually a very, very old technique. So, um, this person, uh, W. E. B. Scott, William Scott, sort of stumbled on to moon watching in the late 1800s when he was doing an astronomy project. He was just looking at the moon with a telescope, and he saw a bird, and then he saw another bird. So he, he realized at that point, well, this is a good way to actually observe birds. But nobody really did anything with it for about 100 years, or a little less than 100 years. In the 1950s, um, this, uh, this other scientist, uh, Lowry, caught on to the idea of moon watching and decided, let's have a big nationwide moon watching project. So he recruited a bunch of people to do moon watching all over the United States on, uh, on a few nights in October. Um, not really the best time, because spring migration is much more intense than fall migration. But he. Uh, he organized this and um, did this in 1952 and waited like 13, 14 years to publish. All you students need to publish your papers quickly or you'll end up like, like well, Lowry's was pretty successful. But he didn't get his paper out for a long time, so there wasn't much attention paid to moon watching. One reason is that the one thing that Lowry proved with this study was that moon watching is really, really hard and it's really, really boring and you have to stay up all night long and you have to pay attention all night long because you have to really, really watch the moon closely. So nobody liked it very much. So what we decided to do was we tried to, to automate moon watching. We tried to find a way to make it so you didn't have to stay up all night long. You could just push a button and go to bed and then you would have hot, fresh data in the morning that you could work with. We're not quite that far along, but we're close. So um, this is my postdoc, uh, Wes Honeycutt. And uh, this is his invention. This is the this is the the, the moon watcher, the automated moon watching device. Um, I can zoom in on that a little bit to show you that um, it's got a spotting scope on it, and you can mount a camera to that spotting scope. It's got a couple of motors, so the scope can move around. It's got a, a Raspberry Pi computer. Anybody heard of Raspberry Pi computers? They cost about you know thirty forty dollars, and um, they can do everything that a computer. So we um, have the Raspberry Pi controlling these motors uh, and also, and also uh, monitoring the, the image from the spotting scope. So as the moon drifts out of the field of view, the motors are moved and they, and they compensate and they keep, the, they keep the moon in the field of view for a long time. Um, all of these, everything except the spotting scope we, and the computer, we kind of put together in the lab. So this is, this is all the moving parts for the for the um, for the moon watcher, this is this is the output from a laser cutter. If you get if, if you ever have a chance to get some equipment for your university, get a laser cutter. They're great. Um, you can make lots of stuff with them. So this just cuts everything out of a piece of plastic, so uh, plexiglass, and uh, and then you can put it together. So here is we made several of these. We've sent them to a few people to try out. So there's a few moon watchers um, ready to go, and Here's the fun part of my talk. So this is where I'm going to show you some footage from the Moon Watcher, and you have to see if you can count the birds. I'm going to show you a video, and there's going to be 10 birds crossing the moon in six seconds. So this is, this is real footage from our first moon watching attempt. So we got four, four birds there, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, something like that. Did everybody get that? I'll show it one more time. There's a few, a few down at the bottom, and then one going across the top. So that's that's just regular footage. There's there's so many birds up there. It, it it had me amazed, even though I sort of I'm supposed to know that already. Um, 
Here's an interesting one. So here's a bird that kind of enters uh, from the right and loops down, then goes up, and then does a quick dive and loops back up. Um, I'll just show you this video. It's really hard to see, but it's going to come in right there. You see it? It goes up and up and up, and then it hovers for a second. We had to scratch our heads a little bit. You see a few other birds going by at the same time. Um, we think that's a nighthawk. They do a display where they fly up and hover, and then they dive, and they have these specialized feathers that make a sound when they die. We couldn't hear the sound in the video because we didn't record that sound, but, um, but we think that's what that, that bird was. So, you know, I told you there are a lot of birds, but that's not a very scientific thing to say. How many birds really are there? And um, one way we did this was we found a, a very naive student who didn't know any better, and we said, and, and, and you, you were there, Gabriel. You know what we do to students. Um, we give them impossible tasks. We sat her down and said, all right, I want you to analyze about an hour and a half of video and count the number of birds that you see going across the moon. So she worked on this for about 12 hours total and um, just to add, analyze 87 minutes of video. And she saw 451 birds in just, those, uh, in just that hour and a half. So that's about 5.2, a little more than five birds per minute. And we have another student now doing the same video, and he's going even slower, and he's found even more birds. So we're not sure how deep you can go into this video before you stop finding new birds. And that's one of the challenges for, the next, for this next phase of our project, which is finding a way to automate the counting of the birds. So what I'm showing you here is stabilized video of the moon, and then what we do is we, we call it a video differential or a video uh, difference equation. You're basically taking one frame and comparing it to the next frame. And whatever differences you see in those two frames, they get highlighted. So what you're seeing here is, the, what you're seeing here is movement of the, of the scope. It causes the moon to wobble a little bit, and it creates noise. Noise is bad. Noise makes it difficult to detect the birds. But you can also see, every now and then, you can see a bird flit across the screen. So we're working on algorithms now to separate the birds from the noise. Some of the birds are easy. Some of them you can just barely detect. If you're, if you're so ultimately, we hope to be able to connect the dots and tell which, is, which, is, which of the things that are showing for a video are birds and what's noise. So this, this sounds fun. At least I hope it sounds fun to some of you. But what's, what good is it? What can we do with it? Um, really, this is our best window into nocturnal migration. So in North America, the vast majority of small birds that, that migrate do so at night. We can't see them with the, without, I mean, I used to light up the sky with a big light, but we know that that also affects their migration. We can see birds on radar, but that doesn't really tell us how many birds there are, and we can't tell much about their behavior. It just says that they're, you know, somewhere in this, in this volume of air, there's something reflecting radar. Back. We don't know much more than that. So this really gives us a window into what's going on during bird migration. So we can, we can look at the intensity of bird migration. If we make some assumptions about how fast the birds are moving, we can tell how high they are, how far away from the, from the camera they are. We can tell a little bit about what direction they're flying. Um, one of the things that I think is going to be really interesting is we can also look at migration behavior in a detailed way. We can tell whether birds are flying by themselves or in a small group of two, or if they're flying in a very tight group like this, or if they're flying in these loose groups, sometimes you'll see you know, a bird here, and again, and again. So it looks like they're in a group, but it's kind of a loose group. So I think we, we can quantify all that very precisely with moon watching and, and have some new insights into how birds actually go from point A to point B when they migrate. Another thing we can do is we can maybe even look at wind compensation. So when birds migrate, the wind isn't always blowing in the direction they'd like it to. And so if you look at this video, you can see that, you can see that here's the path of the bird as it goes across the moon. This, this is several frames just combined. But the bird's body orientation is different from the orientation of the flight. So that means that this bird is probably compensating for some wind that's trying to blow it in the wrong direction. So we can actually see this for the first time with, with moon motion. 
So that's all I've got for moon watching. I'll, I'll tell you a, couple, a little bit about a couple more applications that we're working on. These aren't really ready yet, but um, we, we hope someday we can, we can make them available or someday soon. So has anybody heard of MODIS or sensor known? It's a, um, it's a sort of a maker movement um, application where you have these towers set up out in the field. These are, these are um, sort of listening stations for radio tags. You set up this sort of data logger. It collects the data um, on its own from any, any tagged birds that are flying around in the area. You can then take that data and upload it to the internet. If you happen to have a bird that was tagged and flew over one of these stations, it shows you the data. You, you get to eat. And um, there are perhaps uh, close to 12 or 1,300 of these towers, uh, mostly in North America, but there are a few in South America now. Um, so we can study migration. You can also study local movements of birds with these towers. They cost maybe $2,000 to set up, which is somewhat expensive, but nothing compared to um, what it would cost you commercially. Um, the tricky part, though, are the tags. You can have you can, these receivers last forever, but the tags, once you deploy it on a bird, you'll, you're probably never going to see the tag again except in, in your data. So um, the tags typically cost from uh, Companies that cost um, over $150 each, which isn't crazy expensive, but it's more than I can afford and more than a lot of other people can afford, especially if you want to deploy hundreds of tags. So we're working on a tag that's completely programmable, meaning you can emulate any kind of any kind of beeper tag you want. It can also send out a coded signal, so you don't have to rely on using different frequencies. You can use the same frequency for thousands of birds and just send out a different code for each one. Um, and uh, it's, it's programmable so you, and it has a clock. So you can tell it, don't transmit at night because I don't care about those data. It'll save a lot of battery power if you do that. You can say, you could program it to wait a month and then start transmitting. So if you, if you know where the bird is for, an, for the first month, you don't need to waste your battery on, the, on those data. Um, so, in, so you can probably get a lot more mileage out of a programmable tag, as opposed to the tags that are available now, which as soon as you turn them on, they just start beeping and, and draining the back. And you know, we've got we've got them to weigh an appropriate amount for for most of the small birds. Um, and like I was saying, you can, you can program them to, to, to do whatever you want, program them when you want them to function, when you want them to sleep. And we think we can build them for about fifteen dollars, as opposed to one hundred and fifty dollars. Another thing we're working on is a GPS data logger. So if you remember the, the geolocation data loggers, I said that location data are not very accurate. They can be off by a few hundred kilometers. Um, but if we can replace it with this, now we have accuracy down to a few meters. So um, there are already lots of GPS loggers out there. But none of them that we know of are small enough to use with a lot of birds. And the ones that are fairly small cost several hundred dollars each. Um, we think we can make one for about $50. Um, and we think we can also, in addition to just doing GPS, we think we can also throw in a few more of those sensors that I was telling you about that don't, that don't really cost them very much. So we have a design right now that's got a um, voltage regulator, but it's also got this multi-sensor on it that can tell you the temperature, the humidity, the air pressure, and what we call VOC, that stands for volatilized organic compounds, it's air pollution. So we can get, a, we can get an air pollution reading uh, in addition to these other environmental variables. Um, the microprocessor has, it works with Wi-Fi. So that means if you can get close to the bird, you don't have to recapture it, you just have to get close to the bird to get all the, all the data from it. Maybe you can even use your phone because your phone uses Wi-Fi too. Um, so that would be great. Maybe we can get it up to 500 meters or something like that. So if you can see the bird, you can get your data back. Um, it's got a memory and a GPS. And then one other thing that one from there is a movement sensor. So it's a it, it acts. It, it's it's what we call a nine-axis sensor. It can tell any kind of change in the bird's uh, orientation, uh, up, down, side to side. Um, if you're if you sail boats, you know what yaw and pitch are. You can, you you can get all those, all those different axes, and uh, also the magnetic field. So we can perhaps get look a little bit of uh, data from that as well.
And the idea behind all this is um, we want to know, of course, where are the birds going? But um, the reason we got some funding to do this is because we also can look at what the conditions, uh, what conditions the birds encounter when they're mo moving to their destination. We sort of sold this as we're going to use the birds as a platform for sensing the, the lower atmosphere. So we're collaborating with uh, meteorologists, with people who study the weather, to, um, to do this project. So the weathermen are now using the birds as their as their sensor system. So that's all I've got. Um, I want to say thank you to all these people I've been working with. And I guess I'll also point out that, like I said, you will hear the maker movement at some point. There are maker spaces coming your way. There's already a bunch of a bunch of maker spaces that light up the map. If you Google makerspace in Sao Paulo, it's here. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity, especially for students to get involved in, um, in learning how to use and make some of the tools that, that are being uh, put out there by, uh, by my lab and by thousands of other people all over the world. Um, so that's about it. I want to thank all, my, uh, all the people who have sponsored my work and helped me come here. And thanks finally to all of you for listening. these birds in South America. We're also going to be tracking birds in, in North America, up here in the normal breeding range, and collecting, uh, collecting blood samples so we can actually see what's the, what's the, what's the origin of this group. Um, what's, what's, what, where, where did they come from in the North American group? What's their genetic linkage to the, to the other, to their parent population? So we'll look, we'll look at that, and then we'll look at the parent population migration and see what it is. Um, but we don't really know why. Um, one thing that might be the trigger is that, and, and it might be the reason we're seeing this in these two different species, both of which will nest on bridges. They'll build their nests on, 
on bridges. Well, bridges have only been around in South America for um, maybe a little over 100 years, or at least lots of bridges. So it could be that they find themselves with a, an appropriate habitat for nesting. And so here we go. Here's an opportunity to get, to, to get some extra breeding activity. Another issue is that the first year birds in the north, if they're born in the north, the first year birds haven't completed their feather, their first molt when they start fall migration. So it could be that they are a little bit behind the, the normal life schedule, the normal <coughs> life cycle. So by the time they migrate back north, they're still behind, they're late, and it's too late for them to breed. So they have to forego breeding their first year, which of course isn't good for these birds. They only live five years, maybe. Um, so then they come back south again, and they still haven't had a breeding opportunity. But they're ready to go. They're mature. And here they are. They find themselves in a habitat that's suitable. So they say, I'm going to breed right here. I'm ready. I missed my chance in the north, so I'll take advantage of it here. So those birds that can't breed in their first their first year might be the ones that are doing this behavior. It lets them get offspring down in the south. It's one of the 10 or 12 pairs of birds only. Yeah. Just small and um, they, we've, they found birds that have, look like they've tried to breed successfully for, you know, in, in the past, but they've never actually done it. So we think this is the first time they've actually successfully um, fledged young. So, so one of those birds that, that I showed, one of these tracks, um, in fact, I think it's this, the blue one, we're pretty sure that that female was born in the north. So that's a bird that was born in the north. These other two might have been born in Via Maria, they might be part of the first generation of offspring. We're not sure because we can't catch them all. We didn't mark them all. Do you guys have an idea about how they deal with the weather conditions? Because if they migrate to North America, they will probably find like a warm and cold and warm and nice weather as a migration. But here, south here, we have the winter and they can't like escape of the that's what they're doing. That's, that's what this migration is. is. They're escaping the winter. Yeah, but I mean when season. they breed here. Mm -hmm. They breed they breed in the summer here. They breed in the Austral summer. Ah, so the entire cycle Yeah, so they're, they're they're here breeding during the summer, summer. in Argentina. So they they breed in December. And then they migrate, they start migrating in January and February. And they're, they're back here in, in North America. The, the color over here is supposed to, supposed to give you some indication of where they, of, of, of what the season is. So that circle up there in Oklahoma is mostly green and blue. So that's like April to July. They're spending the entire austral winter up there in Oklahoma where it's nice and warm. Too warm, if you ask me. <laughs> so th th these birds that are breeding in South America are up there flying around with other cliff swallows that are breeding in Oklahoma. But <coughs> we're sure that these birds are not breeding twice because we can look at the we can look at the light levels and whenever they go into their into their nest it gets dark. So if you if you look at a breeding bird you'll see it goes light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, or all day long. They're going in and out of the nest. The ones that are up here in Oklahoma, it's light all day long. They're flying around, they're out in the sun all day long. So they're not breeding twice. Um, they just switched. Yeah? I have a curiosity about the last uh, gadget you showed. Uh, it's super interesting because they are super tiny, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, there are lots of things you can measure. Yep. I was wondering how big is the battery and if that is the limiting factor for how long it will last. It is. It is a little bit. Um, so here it is the tag. Recharge the battery. Um, 
this is like this is the smallest battery I think we can use with it. And I think our total weight will be around three grams. That's fantastic. And we can use larger batteries if you want to use glass water.
responsibility, especially if I was lost for them, I might have only three or four years. Então, que é a 1 hora da tarde no laboratório 19, né, do IB. 
e ele vai apresentar um pouco mais sobre projetos, proje subprojetos e projetos é, paralelos para serem desenvolvidos por alunos. Então, se vocês conhecerem uh, alunos que gostariam de saber sobre essas oportunidades, podem encaminhar também essa, uh, essa conversa, digamos assim, na quinta-feira. Tá? Então, vai ser uma apresentação curta e mais para divulgar mesmo, esperar que, uh, que isso possa fomentar novas colaborações com vocês e com outros, tá bom? Muito obrigada pela minha presença. Thank you, Robert. Okay. Thank you for the introduction, Marina, um, and thank you all for coming um, and giving me the opportunity to present here. Um, so I'm not quite sure what you said, but uh, I'm a PhD student from uh, Utrecht University in the Netherlands, uh, where I started a few months ago on this collaborative project, uh, which is funded by Papespi uh, and the Dutch scientific organization. Um, and the topic is the contribution of mutualistic plant food for interactions to biodiversity and ecosystem restoration um, of the Atlantic forests. Um, I'm very excited to get started on this project. Um, so, but before I go into details, details about the project itself, I'd just like to uh, highlight the team members. So like I said, it's a collaboration between uh, Brazilian and Dutch researchers. Um, so here in Brazil, Marina Cortes is the principal investigator. Um, and then we also have uh, Mark Pizzo and Matias Pires from uh, Unicom involved, so we're very happy for that. Um, and then in the Netherlands, um, Mio Son, she's my main supervisor uh, and she's the Dutch principal investigator. Um, and then uh, my other supervisor, Marijke van Kuyk, um, some of you may have seen she visited the group about one and a half years ago and she gave a presentation here in this group. Um, and then we also have Jaburi Gazul, who is a professor at ETH in Switzerland. Um, and he works closely together with people for, in our group already for many years. Um, so he will also be um, having an advisory role in this project. Um, then we also plan on hiring two technicians, one for field work and one for molecular work. Um, and it looks like we might already have our field technician sitting over there. So. It's not 100% sure yet, but we're hoping. Um, so that would be nice. Um, so now I'll move on to the project itself. So I'll start with a um, brief introduction, and then talk about research questions, and then uh, talk about the methodology. So you all know that we're losing old growth for us at alarming rates. Um, it's estimated that we've already lost 2.3 million square kilometers of forest cover worldwide, uh, which is approximately the size of Greenland um, and with this loss of forest we're not only losing um, the forest itself but also the species that inhabit the forest um, and important ecosystem services that the forest provides. Um, luckily at the same time we're also seeing an increased awareness in the importance of forests um, which is also reflected um, in the number of restoration programs uh, going on worldwide. So one important uh, restoration program is the Bond Challenge which is a global initiative to restore uh, 1.5 million square kilometers of degraded land by 2020 and as much as 3.5 million square kilometers by 2030. Um, and so far almost 60 countries have made pledges to this challenge, um, including Brazil. Um, and it looks like we'll reach the target, uh, the 2020 target. Um, and this is a good development, um, but also partly because these restored for us, have the potential to mitigate uh, loss of biodiversity and ecosystem services uh, associated with uh, loss of old growth for us. Um, however, to what extent they do so will depend on the type of forest restoration. Um, so, in fact, 45% of the pledges made under the Bone Challenge are to restore monoculture plantations or to plant monoculture plantations, um, often of fast growing species such as acacia or eucalypt. Um, and these plantations tend to be harvested in, in 10 to 20 year cycles and because of that they store um, up to 40 times less carbon compared to natural forests and it has also been shown that um, species richness in these plantations is often very low, uh, sometimes even lower compared to the degraded land before it was restored. Um, then another type of restoration is agroforestry, this is where um, crops and trees are, are grown together. 
Um, and this mainly has social economic benefits for, for local communities, but it has also been uh, shown to increase biodiversity levels. Um, and then finally, we have natural regeneration. This is where human dominated uh, land use forms, such as agricultural lands, are abandoned and the forest uh, is given the opportunity to recolonize that land. Um, and this can be uh, actively or, or can be promoted by, by us viewers by uh, simply placing fences around it to prevent disturbance, but also by actively planting seeds or seedlings. Um, and from an ecological perspective, this is the most interesting type of restoration, um, as this type of forest is the uh, highest potential to recover in terms of species richness, uh, but also in terms of uh, ecosystem services. So this is something that's been studied a lot. Uh, many studies have looked at like prone sequence of secondary forests um, to see how species richness but also vegetation structure recovers. So I'm just showing the results here of one such study. Um, this was done in Puerto Rico where they looked at uh, natural regeneration on, on former pastures. Uh, and they found that within relatively short time, so within about 40 um, decades, uh, yeah, 40 years, uh, species richness recovered to similar levels as uh, in the reference uh, old growth conditions. And the same was true for vegetation structure. So for vegetation structure, they looked at total biomass, uh, the stem density, and the basal area. And as you can see, they all recovered to uh, similar levels within a relatively short time period. Um, but it has to be said that species composition did still significantly differ. So you have a larger proportion of pioneer species and also a larger proportion of uh, exotic species compared to old growth, of course. So the speed of recovery uh, and also the final composition of the forest will uh, mainly depend on the recolonization by plant species, uh, which is known to be affected by a number of factors. So first of all, by the state of degradation. Uh, so with this, I mean whether the original forest was completely logged or whether it was uh, selectively logged. Uh, this also determines the state of soil degradation. Um, secondly, we have the amount of seeds in the landscape uh, of native species. So if you have a larger seed source, then uh, within the, uh, the landscape surrounding the restoration site, then uh, recovery is also likely to um, take place more quickly. Um, this is also related to the dispersal distance. So if the distance between the seed source and your restoration site is smaller, then uh, this will promote uh, recovery. And finally, uh, many plants depend on animals for the dispersal of their seeds. So if you have a healthy uh, dispersal community, healthy animal community, then this is also likely to promote uh, recognition and uh, recovery. So actually, these last three factors uh, are all uh, affected by landscape connectivity. Um, so, in forest studies, uh, landscape connectivity is often reflected by the proportion of native forests within a certain uh, landscape. So, if you have more forests covered and you have a larger seed source, uh, the dispersal distances will generally be smaller and you have uh, a healthier dispersal community. Uh, so, like I just said, uh, many uh, plants depend on animals for their dispersal. Um, this is particularly true in the tropics, where up to 90% of all woody plants uh, are dispersed or depend on animals for their dispersal. But this is also the region where human pressures tend to be greatest, so in terms of hunting, but also horse loss um, and fragmentation. Um, and it has been shown that from human impacted landscapes, uh, the large dispersers are often the first to disappear. Um, and the loss of large dispersals in turn is being related to uh, reduced colonization of late successional species, um, but it has also been related to an increase in small seeded plants. So this study was actually done by Leo and Mauro Belletti and others. Um, and they, in this study, they also found a link between um, the seed diameter and the wood density of the species. So, species that um, or plant species that tend to have lower uh, or smaller seeds also tend to have lower wood density. So if you lose your large dispersers from the forest, then this is also likely to affect the carbon storage capacity of the forest in the, in the long term. 
Um, in human impacted landscapes, and especially fragmented landscapes, you also see an increase in uh, small bodied uh, generalist dispersers um, that are capable of traversing the matrix surrounding the forest fragments. Um, and hereby, they often also introduce or bring in seeds from uh, non native or non forest species into the forest. So, you see an influx of, of new species. Uh, so considering the importance uh, animals uh, play in dispersal seeds and thereby also likely in the uh, recovery of forests, it's surprising that we could only find one study that um, focused on the, on the network approach in, in forest restoration studies. Um, and this study was done by the Silva and others in 2015, where they compared three different uh, actively restored sites of different age. So, varying from 15 to 57 years old. Um, and they calculated all kinds of network dynamics uh, or network properties that describe the complexity of the, uh, the complexity and the structure of the networks. Um, but they didn't link this to biodiversity or ecosystem service changes. Um, and these were actively restored sites. So they, uh, the number of species that was planted at the beginning of restoration Different quite a lot between the sites, which might have had an influence on the results as well. Um, and landscape connectivity wasn't considered in this study. So there's still a lot of things that we don't know about uh, these network dynamics, so how they are affected by um, landscape connectivity and how they change over time, so as the fragments become older. And this is the focus of our study. Um, and the main advantage of studying these ecological networks is that they reflect ecosystems more fully. And when you focus on just a single or a number of individuals or species or, or population of species. So our main research questions are, uh, first of all, how do these um, dispersal networks develop in generating fragments? Uh, and how is this affected by landscape productivity? So these, once again, these are the two main factors that we're interested in. Um, and secondly, we want to see how do um, changes in the networks regulates the functioning of biodiversity and the carbon sequestration of these regenerating fragments. So we aim to do this through a network approach, whereby we focus on the whole community um, and the interactions between the dispersers and the plants, but also by um, having a species approach whereby we focus on a uh, late successional tree species um, and we try and study see dispersal processes in more depth for this uh, yeah, at the population level, to also see how genetic diversity is affected by, by these two factors. Um, so here, when we're talking about biodiversity, we're not only talking about species species, we're also talking about genetic diversity. Uh, and finally, because we want to come up with guidelines that aid restoration uh, management, uh, our last question is related to this, so where and how will forest restoration be most successful? Um, yeah, so those are our research questions. I think I can skip this slide. You all know the Atlantic Forest. Um, so our study region is the Kurumbatai uh, River Basin, which is basically your uh, backyard. Um, so in this region, um, Pedro Bracalion and, and colleagues from uh, USP have uh, conducted plant surveys in 72 uh, plots. And these plots are 45 by 20 meters. Um, and they are located in different types of forests. So they looked at um, different types of forest restoration. So they have plots in natural regeneration of former eucalypt plantations, but also former pastures. Uh, they have some active restoration sites, um, and then as kind of a reference condition, they have old growth conserved sites. Um, and then for each restoration type, they also have plots in fragments of different age. They're like a chrono sequence of secondary forest fragments and also covering the gradients of landscape productivity. So from these sites we plan to select uh, a number of sites and we'll be focusing on the natural regeneration of former pasture sites because uh, this is one of the more common uh, regeneration types in the Atlantic forest. Um, so most of the data that I was just talking about of these plots uh, has been published in a number of articles. Um, but Pedro has also shared the data set with us. Um, so this is yeah, very convenient for our study. Um, so, so far we've 
from these foropatia sites. He has 22 plots of foropatia uh, for experiments. We've selected nine so far, um, with a covering of, yeah, which are highlighted here in, as the larger dots. So the smaller dots are the other plots sampled by Pedro. Um, and the colors indicate the age class. So we've selected nine so far, uh, covering a chrono sequence um, and also gradients of landscape connectivity. Um, and in the selection, we try to avoid spatial autocorrelation and pseudo replication as much as possible because um, many of the plots are actually also located in the same, within the same fragment. Uh, so this is something we wanted to avoid. Um, we're hoping to add more sites as we go along, including some old growth reference sites. Um, this will also depend on how labor intensive the uh, field work is. So for now, we'll start with these nine. Um, so we made some graphs to check the correlation between our main factors of interest, of course, age and surrounding forest cover. Um, and like this is the left graph shows um, this for all the plots and former features sampled by uh, Blanca Leon. And luckily there's no correlation, um, and this is the same graph but showing it for the nine sites we selected so far. Because it's important that these two factors aren't correlated, because if they are then it's no longer possible to distinguish between uh, the effects of either forest age or surrounding forest cover. Um, so you might be wondering why is this guy coming all the way from the Netherlands um, to the Atlantic forest and then he's going to do field work in these small isolated forest patches. Why don't you just go to the birds? So 191 species have been identified of 42 different families. So that was quite surprising for me at least. Uh, coming from the Netherlands. So to construct the networks we need to collect uh, data on plant food for interactions. So for this we we'll have two approaches. One is a plant-oriented approach whereby we um, will be conducting surveys throughout the year um, within these plots to, uh, to monitor fruit ecology. So we're interested to know which um, species is fruiting during which time of the year. Um, then once we identify uh, fruiting species, we'll select a number of four individual species for focal observation. So for these individuals, we will record all the animal species um, seen uh, feeding on fruits, also the number of individuals of each species, um, and we'll report the fruit handling behavior. So we're interested to know whether they ingest the whole fruit, including the seeds, or whether they just uh, pick up the pulp and drop the seeds, because it determines whether they're true dispersers or not. Um, so we'll be focusing on the canopy, uh, but also on the, on the ground where mammals and, and ground foraging birds can act as secondary dispersers. Um, so for the, for the ground interactions we'll be using camera traps. Um, and for the canopy we're still figuring out whether we're going to use focal observations in the field or whether we can set up cameras in the tree to record these events. So this is something that uh, we're also currently testing So the sampling intensity will be based on interaction accumulation curves, whereby we have the number of unique interactions on the y-axis uh, and the sampling efforts, uh, which can be either the number of the total number of observation hours or the uh, total uh, number of recorded sea disposal events uh, on the x-axis, and then based on where this curve levels off, um, yeah, we'll determine how long we have to observe these trees for. So that was the plant-oriented approach. Um, we'd also like to use an animal-oriented approach, um, whereby we set up mist nets to capture birds in the fragments, um, and then by placing a plastic sheet under the mist nets, we can capture the birds, and often they uh, drop their feces. Uh, so we can collect it on the plastic sheet, and then we can analyze the feces for um, for plant seeds and see which animal is responsible for the dispersal of which seeds. Um, and it would also be interesting to do some germination experiments to see, uh, yeah, to, to compare the viability of digested seeds compared to undigested seeds. And we could also do the same uh, to compare 
digested seeds of different animal species to see if that affects um, germination rates as well. So myself, I'll mainly be focusing on the plant-oriented approach, um, but this would make a nice student project. If you are interested or know anyone that would like to do this kind of work, then uh, please come to me after the presentation. Um, so once we have the data collected from the plant and animal oriented approaches, we can construct the networks. Um, we do this in R using the apartheid package. And the result is something like this. So for each fragment we'll have a network, um, whereby here the red boxes that represent the bird species, the plants up here, and the grey lines indicate the interactions between the two. So see the dispersal events, and the width of the box or the line indicates the relative importance or, or relative abundance of the species or interaction in the network. So once we've constructed these networks, there's all kinds of things that we compare among the fragments. So the most simple thing will just to look at species richness of the, uh, both the plant community and, and the animal community uh, and see if we observe shifts as the fragments become older or uh, more connected. We can also try and identify uh, like important species that play a central role within these fragments by connecting many different species. Um, we also plan on calculating functional richness based on the number of uh, plant and animal traits. Uh, so we can see whether we observe a change in, in, in traits, uh, once again as fragment becomes older or more connected. So we can see, for example, if the proportion of large bodied uh, dispersers might increase as the fragment becomes older. Uh, and finally, we can calculate the number of network properties. Uh, so I've listed some of them here. Uh, I'm not going to discuss them all, but I'd just like to highlight uh, two of them. So nestedness uh, measures how strongly species interactions of little connected species uh, are nested within those highly connected species. So this network here is actually a nice example of a nested network whereby you see that the specialist plants depend on generalist dispersers and the uh, generalist plants depend on specialist dispersers. Then we have robustness, which quantifies how quickly plant species go extinct um, when fruit spores are randomly eliminated from the network. So this is something I would like to highlight in, in the next few slides. Um, so the aim is to simulate the loss of uh, certain fruit spores uh, to see how this affects the plant community and ultimately also carbon stocks. So for this we could either simulate the extinction of uh, specific fruit spores, so for example species that is threatened with extinction in the region, or we could focus on uh, entire functional groups. So similar to what's done in the study by uh, Bayo, we could see what happens if we eliminate the large body dispersers from the network. Um, and in order to see how it affects carbon stocks, we have to calculate the buffer and biomass of each plot. Now we can do this using Chow's elementary equation. Um, and for this, you need the diameter of rest height of each tree species, uh, or individual, sorry, uh, the width uh, density of each species, and the total tree height of each individual. And then you can simply convert it to uh, carbon stocks using the uh, IPCC recommended uh, ratio of 0 0.47. So just to make this a little bit more, uh, or to visualize it a little bit more, so we can see what happens if we eliminate uh, certain species. So first of all, um, if we eliminate the specialist disperser, which only has one link, you can imagine that it doesn't really affect the structure of the network. Um, so not only does it, it doesn't affect the structure, but it, we also see that no unique interactions are lost. Um, because this generalist dispersion has, isn't dependent on the species, it relies on many different uh, animals. But if we were to eliminate the topo in this example, um, then you can imagine it really affects the structure of the network, um, and it also in this case needs to be a uh, loss of unique interaction. So this plant species uh, no longer has a dispersion in this, in this fragment, uh, and considering that none of the other dispersers take over its role, um, the species could go extinct or locally extinct in the future. Uh, yes, this is just some of the things we can do, but of course it's um, 
as this study is focusing on the regeneration of forest fragments, it might be more interesting not to look at the loss of fruit forest, but what happens if we uh, have new species uh, reaching the fragments. Um, so this is something we can also do. Um, we haven't worked it out in much detail yet, but it's something that will be happening in a later stage of the study. Uh, but it's just to give you an idea of the things we can do. Uh, and finally, I'd like to finish with the species approach. Uh, this will mainly be led by Marina. Um, for this, we'll be focusing on, on a long-lived, uh, preferably late succession of tree species, uh, because they're more interesting from a carbon storage perspective. Um, another criteria is, of course, that it's dispersed by birds and mammals, and it should also be relatively common, so we want it to be present in all of our selected fragments in the plots. Uh, so once we've selected the tree species for this, um, the idea is to take uh, or to map all the recruits, so plants up to about 40 centimeters in height, within our 45 or 20 meter plot. And then from each recruit we'll take new samples. Um, the idea is to do the same for the adult trees, but also within a 40 meter buffer surrounding our plot. And from the adult trees we'll take uh, trunk samples. Um, and then these leaf and trunk samples will be taken to the lab where we can extract the DNA uh, to determine the multilocus genotype of each uh, individual. Um, and based on this, we can track the parents' plants of each uh, recruit. And this is interesting because once you know where the parent plant is, you can calculate the dispersal distance, or you can simply measure the dispersal distance. Um, but we also plan to uh, look at the genetic diversity of the population and we can also calculate seed immigration rates. So we define this as a proportion of recruits not assigned to any tree within the sample uh, area. So in this example we had four recruits within our plots um, and for only one of them we couldn't identify the parent tree. So in this case the seed immigration rate would be 25%. And then as a final step, uh, we would like to relate these three factors, so dispersal distance, seed immigration rates, uh, and also the genetic diversity uh, of the population, to once again these same fragment characteristics, so forest age and uh, landscape connectivity, and also to the dispersal community within the fragments. So that's broadly uh, and briefly the, uh, the plans we have, so just to summarize, we've seen that there's an increased uh, interest in forest restoration uh, through programs such as the Bone Challenge. Uh, and these restored forests have the potential to mitigate the loss of biodiversity and ecosystem services. Um, however, to what extent they do so will depend on uh, the dispersed community that is present. Um, and we've seen that there's still some knowledge gaps here, so this is what we uh, we'll be focusing on, so in particular we want to focus on how these networks develop over time, so as the fragments become older, and, um, and how they are affected by the amount of forests within the landscape. Um, and then we want to see how this affects the diversity of ecosystem services within these fragments. Uh, we had to do this through a network approach and a species approach, which I'll both explain to you. Um, and based on this, we're going to come up with some guidelines, such as what are the important species uh, that play a central role within the fragments, um, and connecting many species, but also among fragments at the net population level, to see which species or interactions uh, are important for connecting fragments. Um, we also hope to come up with uh, like guidelines on suitable areas for restoration based on minimum uh, landscape connectivity requirements, uh, and finally, uh, we want to see how we can maximize carbon stock potential of these forest fragments. Okay, so this stopped working, but this was basically my uh, last slide, so uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs> Yeah, that's amazing. I hope you can do it. And actually, I have another, another possibility, maybe. 
if I understood well, are you going to make the genetic to, to see the, the mother plant and the, um, the, 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 the seedling for the community in the restored areas? Just, just for one species? Just for one species, yeah. Because I was wondering, given that you're going to, to use the nets as well, to, to get the birds, right? Mm -hmm. So are you going to collect the seeds, drop it from the birds as well? And to see what they are uh, feeding on and dispersing? It wasn't uh, one of our plans, but it sounds like an interesting. I know, just because for me, I mean, one of these very interesting like, questions and next steps is exactly what interactions are connecting the fragments. So, mm -hmm. given that you are established this huge new project, perhaps doing something like Pedro does with the genetics of the seeds to see the modern plants, but then you have to know the whole community. So, maybe then you could identify where the present in our plots we will and they carry fruits then we will also record the interactions for, for these species yeah. yeah so depending on whether they're present in the fragments we will include them yeah. well, first congrats for, for this work it's going to be a lot of work <laughs> <laughs> so that's full of strength uh, I, now I, I see yeah, yeah, yeah. next year so that's so the first time and also the full of strength so, uh, I saw that you, you, uh, you're going to do like a functional analysis yeah. with the seeds and the birds. So I was wondering, uh, like for the functional traits of the plants, have you ever think about doing nutritional content, like proximate chemical analysis? So this is going to be basic, but like protein, carbohydrates, yeah. and lipids. I think it would be interesting um, to include this, but it might be possible to do this based on already published Okay. But I think there are some databases that might. Yeah, we do. We do have a lot of variation in chemical composition of the fruits, but I uh, mean also the individual. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, because we, uh, just thinking about the, the network between the, the, the fruits and uh, the fruit growers. So as, I believe that as, as many functional traits you have, the more it's going to be easy for you to analyze and you can get a more clear picture of this network. So from, from the plant side. I think one thing that I miss is the chemical composition. Uh -huh. okay. From the bird side, two things that I suggest you to do, uh, like the capacity for dispersion, like wing morphology. Yeah. So you're going to collect the bat, the bird, bat bird. <laughs> <laughs> but, so it's actually going to collect the bird without having bird in hands. Yeah. Take photos. And it's, it's easy to measure the, the wing, wing morphology, like you know, yeah. expect rate or wing loading. So you can, you can have a very good clue about the movement patterns. Yeah, and, uh, and the second thing that I think you should do, it's going to be a little bit more complicated. But I'm wondering how many of these birds, they are truly from the yeah. Okay, so this might make a difference for our network as well. This is why the market Yeah, but uh, yeah. You, may, you may get a glimpse with the, with the, the FICO analysis. 
Yeah. But if, uh, yeah. I was thinking about some more fancy thing like isotopes, but <laughs> okay, yeah, you're gonna collect species, so so. But think about this: if you can classify a hanky, the, the bird is from a hank from marginal Yeah, I think we will also classify the, the level of food for the birds. Um, maybe not using isotopes, but basically. Yeah, but yeah, you just require have the fecal, you have the fecal surface, so yeah. Yeah. One last question that I have to do with the about your, your proposal and one thing that is very we have been looking at at least on my side and with this recovery areas, even late recovered areas is that they do not represent each one the regular amount of resource you should have in that area. Even if you have a diversity of species as you mentioned, these species a lot of times they do not offer enough not fruit, but the protocols, because there is not a dominance of uh, herb dispersal species, because they are not fruity after all, or they are not fruity that much, or, they, or there is a difference in the amount of fruits that are produced in each of these categories. And if you compare that with a regular, let's say, not too much disturbed forest, you will not have the same quantum. So you probably have a problem with the <coughs> Because the data is there. 
Yeah, I think we could use the, because we're going to be doing surveys to know when the species are fruiting, so we could also use these surveys to gather more information. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But Lisa, we really want to have a student to do the knowledge board, so if you have a student that is a project.
de uma banca para vocês, então, uma banca vai dar palestra em inglês depois. A gente pode discutir se tivesse em espanhol ou inglês, mas enfim, melhor que seja em inglês. É, bom, a Blanca é, estudou na Universidade Autônoma de Barcelona, fez ciências biológicas lá, e a gente teve o prazer de trabalhar com ela enquanto estava em Sevilha também, com o Pedro, que a gente se conheceu lá. E agora ela tá, vai apresentar para a gente o trabalho que ela fez com o Pedro de, de mestrado, em Goiânia também. E com o Pedro e com o Nath Bartomeus, que é uma pessoa que trabalha em Goiânia, e eles estão fazendo algo super bacana de Gates, que é essas coisas assim, next step, né? Então, uma das coisas importantes é entender redes a nível individual, que ela vai explicar para vocês, e também eles estão usando os modelos novos para a gente entender como que essas estruturas de rede emergem. Então, assim, uma parte bem, bem interessante, que certeza os próximos papers aí do Pedro vão começar a sair nesse sentido. E é isso, eu acho, eu acho que deixo a palavra com você. E ela vai falar bem devagar, né? prometeu, que é o meu espaço. É, então, vocês... Okay. I'm Blanca Arroyo Correa, a Stein Animation. I'm working with Pedro Corbano at Doñana Biological Station. And I'm going to present the main results of my master thesis, which is entitled the Consequences of Plant Phenotypic and Macrocell Variation in Individual Based Pollination Networks. Within a generalist pollination system, we can find differences, important differences between the pollination niche at the population level, that is here, and the pollination niche at the individual, individual plant level. The pollination niche at the population level is usually, is usually broader, that is, uh, the set of uh, pollinators uh, visiting the population is wider, uh, uh, while the uh, pollination niche at the individual level is usually uh, narrower and we can find differences between the individual plants uh, in the pollination niche. These differences in the pollination niche among individual plants uh, within the same population can be assessed using an individual based network approach. In the bipartite uh, version of this uh, network approach, we can find uh, two different set of nodes. Uh, the first uh, set of nodes uh, here comprise uh, all the individual plants in the population, and the second set of nodes comprise the pollinator species or the pollinator functional groups visiting the, those individual plants in the, in the plant population. The links among those uh, different um, set of no nodes are, uh, can be, for example, floral vegetations. In this way, uh, we can incorporate the interspecific variation at the plant population level in contrast to the community-based uh, uh, network approach, species, species network approach. When this bipartite network is projected into the uh, unipartite network, we only have uh, one, one unique uh, set of nodes that, uh, in this case, are the, the individual plants in the population. And the links among those individual plants can be, uh, for instance, the um, level of pollinator sharing or the number of, of pollinator share between those individual plants. Therefore, these links here in the unipartite network can be uh, seen as a proxy of uh, pollen flow and therefore of potential mating events of, uh, among those plants in the population. Thus, uh, this uh, unipartite uh, network approach, individual-based network approach, can be very useful to uh, assess how the pollen transfer occurs in the population and uh, its functional consequences for the population uh, performance. The level of pollinator sharing between individual plants uh, in the population, in the plant population, can be determined by the interpopulation variation among individual, individual plants in, for instance, uh, phenotypic traits, microsite characteristics, or the flower phenology of these individual plants. If a pollinator group or, or pollinator species, a given pollinator, prefer a one phenotype or a one uh, microsite over another one, those plants displaying uh, similar phenotypes or similar microsite characteristics would tend to share more uh, a higher number of pollinators 
than those plants that display uh, different phenotypic traits or microcyte characteristics. Therefore, uh, these plant, individual plants in the population that uh, with similar phenotypic traits or, 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 or microcyte characteristics would tend to form a well-connected subset of, uh, of individual, individual plants in the population in terms of pollinator sharing. In a similar way, those, uh, only those plants in the population that uh, flower in the same time period can share pollinators because uh, pollinators functional groups or pollinator species usually have a, a, are active uh, for a, a specific time period. In this study, uh, we have uh, two main groups of objectives. The first one is more related to the pollinator, uh, plant pollinator visitation patterns, and the second one is uh, more related to the functional consequences of this uh, plant pollinator uh, interaction patterns. In the first uh, group of objectives, we specifically aim to assess to what extent pollinator visitation patterns and the emerging individual, individual plant pollinator networks, that is the bipartite network, are determined by intrinsic and extrinsic plant attributes. By intrinsic, here, we mean the phenotypic traits and the flowering phenology, while by uh, extrinsic here, we mean microsite characteristics of uh, individual plants. In the second group of objectives, we uh, specifically aim to assess whether the configuration of the plant's plant network derived from, from pollinator sharing, that is the uh, unipartite network, and the plant's reproductive success is influenced by intrinsic and extrinsic plant attributes. This study was performed in uh, the southern coast, uh, the southern Atlantic coast of Spain, in the Nea National Park, which is a Mediterranean type ecosystem. And uh, in this area, we uh, selected a population of Alinium malinifolium, which is a Mediterranean shaft species from the Cisteciae family. And uh, this is the most representative element of the sandy soil vegetation in Tonera National Park. Within the same population sites, we can find a high level of microsite and phenotypic variation among all individual plants forming the population, the plant population. The flower visitor surveys were uh, performed with using cameras and uh, was performed in 60 individual uh, plants randomly selected in the population in such a way that uh, all uh, the aggregated and isolated plants uh, were well uh, represented in the, in the plant population in the study area. Each individual plant, each of the 60 individual plants, were um, surveyed for a total time of 60 minutes. We recorded a total of almost uh, 3,000 interactions from 22 pollinator species. And these 22 pollinator species were aggregated using uh, pollinator functional groups, in eight pollinator functional groups, that were uh, large, medium size, and small bees, large, medium size, and small beetles, hover flies, and bee flies. I forgot to say that uh, all the for, um, flower visitation uh, surveys was performed during the uh, peak flowering season of the of the population of the study population. The individual plant pollinator interaction recorded was uh, were used to uh, create a weighted bipartite matrix that uh, depicts the interaction among each of individual plants in the population and each of uh, the pollinator functional groups visiting those individual plants. This weighted bipartite <coughs> matrix was uh, projected into a weighted unipartite matrix that uh, depicts the uh, pollinator sharing among uh, all pairs of individual plants in the population. That is, this number here represents the, uh, the interaction share between uh, two individual plants in the population. At the end of the flowering peak season, we estimated a female reproductive success as the total number of seeds per plant weighted by seed mass. This um, estimation 
was um, calculated using the total number of flowers uh, during the peak flowering season, the fruit set as the percentage of flowers set in fruit, the, the mean number of seeds per fruit, and a weighting factor estimated by a uh, mean seed mass. We also uh, register a set of intrinsic plant attributes to characterize the phenotypic and phenological variation of individual plants uh, within the population. That was uh, the phenology as an individual flowering synchrony index estimated by modifying a, a previously uh, existing one from Marquis. We also annotated floral traits, traits such as the flower size and the flower guide size, the total number of flowers during the peak flowering season, and the maximum height, diameter, and area of the vegetative structure of individual plants. We also uh, registered the spatial location of individual plants within the population and a set of extensive plant attributes that characterize the microset variation among individual plants in the population. Those were the cover of interspecific and interspecific neighbors within different radios, the distance to the water stream, the distance to the nearest tree, and the distance to the habitat range. To calculate all these extrinsic uh, variables, we uh, use aerial uh, images from uh, drone flights to create an orthomosaic and a 3D surface model. With this uh, 3D surface model, we calculated all the morphometrics measures, such as the, the height, the diameter, and the, uh, I don't remember, the area uh, of the plants, of the individual plants in the population. With the orthomosite, we created a, poly a polygon layer that is here with uh, all the individual plants from all the plant species in the community where the population uh, was located. Using uh, this polygon layer, we calculated all the extrinsic uh, variables that I mentioned before. The association between pollinator visitation patterns and plant attributes was uh, estimated using a canonical correspondence analysis and the association between the female reproductive success, the female fitness, and plant attributes was uh, calculated using a generalized, fitting a generalized linear model and previously accounted for the spatial autocorrelation of plant attributes and uh, female fitness. This uh, GDM uh, fitted with the um, female reproductive success as the response variable was uh, controlled for the effect of individual plant centrality in the network. The individual plant centrality refer refers to uh, how well the individual plants are connected to most other plant specific in the population via shared pollinators. Therefore, we would expect that uh, those plants uh, with higher centrality also uh, would benefit from a uh, more uh, pollen transfer event and therefore would uh, display a higher uh, fitness, female fitness. We use exponential random graph models to test the association between the structure of the pollination networks, both the unipartite and the bipartite network, and the plant attributes. This exponential random graph model uh, is widely used in social networks, but, but is probably used in, in ecological uh, networks, actually. Therefore, uh, these exponential random graph models are uh, so similar to the DDN, the classical generalized linear model in structure, and allows us to um, to assess how different mechanisms different ecological mechanisms structure or shapes the probability of two nodes to interact within a, a given network. In this uh, model, the response variable is the configuration, uh, the overall configuration of the network. That is the absence, the presence, and how uh, the, these links are configured, uh, are configured within the network. The explanatory variables in this uh, exponential random graph model can be uh, two main groups of variables. 
first the endogenous variables that is related to the configuration of the network here the total number of links in the network and exogenous variables that are here uh, that is related to not uh, or link attributes that can configure the uh, probability of a link to, to establish. First, well, the most simplest uh, model uh, is uh, uh, this one uh, using only the topological variable as the, the explanatory variable and assess whether the probability of uh, a link to, to establish is, uh, sorry, is um, determined by the total number of links in the network under a random model. First, first uh, we assess uh, whether the probability of a plant to interact uh, with a set of pollinators were related to the number of links in the network or the uh, extrinsic and intrinsic plant, uh, plant attributes. We fit uh, a second uh, exponential random graph models to assess whether the probability of uh, two plants to share pollinators were uh, dependent on the number of links in the network and the extrinsic and intrinsic plant attributes. We also use this, uh, net, this uh, every, uh, exponential random graph model to assess if, uh, whether there is an association between the probability of share pollinators and the female fitness. We corrected this uh, exponential random graph model using the spatial distance because, because we would expect that those, plant, those plants that uh, uh, were uh, closer would uh, tend to share more pollinators than, more pollinators than uh, those plants that are farther. I'm going to present uh, first the, the results about the, the first uh, objective related, I remind, related to the uh, plant pollinator interaction pattern. We actually found a significant association between pollinator visitation patterns and uh, plant attributes. We specifically found that a set of intrinsic and extrinsic plant attributes increase or decrease the visitation by three uh, functional pollinator functional groups that were medium size B, large treated, and large B. Here, uh, it draws the attention that we uh, didn't find a significant association between the floral phenotypes of individual plants and the uh, pollinator visitation patterns, suggesting that in our population uh, there is not enough variation in the individual plant as to promote the differential attraction for pollinator uh, species or functional group groups in this case. This is the bipartite pollination networks. The green uh, nodes are the, all the individual plants uh, in the plant population, and the orange nodes are the, each of the uh, pollinator functional groups. We can see here that uh, the, the small bees and the medium uh, sized bees were the most central pollinator. That is, uh, that, uh, those uh, pollinator functional groups were. Uh, Establish connection with a uh, most uh, uh, with the highest with the highest number of plants in the in the population the plant population. Here is the result of the exponential random graph model fitted with the bipartite network as the response variable. Here uh, I remind that uh, we aim to assess whether the probability of a plant to interact with the set of pollinators. Were, were associated was associated uh, with different plant attributes, both extensive and intrinsic plant attributes. We found that, as stated by the H uh, estimate, we found that the probability of a plant to interact with the all the set uh, of pollinator functional group was uh, independent of the status of the status of link establishment between uh, all the plants in the network and the set of all the set of pollinators available. We also found that uh, a set of intrinsic and extrinsic variables 
determine this probability, the probability of a plant to interact with a, a higher, a wider set of pollinator functional groups. It draws the attention here that, uh, for example, we found a, a significant negative uh, association between the flowering synchrony of individual plants and the uh, probability of these plants to interact with a set of pollinators. This uh, may be due to uh, the interspecific competition for, for pollinators because uh, those plants uh, flowering more synchronously in, within the population may uh, were, are, are less likely to interact uh, with uh, pollinator functional groups. Here I'm going to present the results about the, the second uh, group of objectives related to the, um, to the functional consequences of plant pollinator uh, interaction patterns. This is the result of a gillian fitted by, uh, with the uh, female fitness uh, as the response variable. We found a positive significant association between the centrality of the plants and the female fitness. Uh, hence, the plants with a higher centrality, with a higher connection to most other conspecific via shared pollinators, tend uh, to have also higher female fitness, as we expected. After correcting for uh, this uh, effect of plant centrality on female fitness, we also found that a set of uh, intrinsic and extrinsic plant attributes also determine directly the female fitness. We didn't found here a, a significant association between the, the floral phenotypes and the female fitness, suggesting that the floral phenotypes in our study sites may uh, not have uh, a, an adaptive uh, value, or this uh, adaptive value may uh, maybe is, is too low. This is the inapartheid uh, network depicting the pattern of uh, shared pollinators between individual plants. The green nodes are the, uh, each of the individual plants uh, in the network. Their size is proportional to the female fitness they have, and the uh, node position is uh, referred to the spatial location within the, the population. Here I remind that uh, the connection among, that we can see among uh, all these uh, individual plants in the population are uh, the level of uh, pollinator sharing, the number of pollinators shared, and therefore it, they can be as a proxy of pollen transfer and potential making events among those individual plants uh, connected by these links. This is the results of the exponential random graph model that uh, we fit with a uh, unipartite network as the response variable. Here we aim to assess whether the probability of uh, two plants to share pollinators within the population were associated to the uh, intraspecific, in, uh, intrinsic and extrinsic plant attributes uh, they display. We found, as stated here in the edge estimate, that the probability of uh, two plants to share pollinators depended on uh, the status, the establishment of uh, links between all nodes in the network. We also found a positive uh, association, significant association, between the probability of, uh, of, share po of pollinator sharing and the female thing. And uh, we also uh, found that uh, a set of intrinsic and extrinsic uh, plant attributes, despite, uh, well, besides having an, a direct effect as shown in the GDM, in the previous GDM, also have uh, an indirect effect on female fitness mediated by uh, the, the pollinator shine. We also found that the as expected, the probability of shared pollinator uh, decreased with the, with the, with the distance uh, among those plants, with the spatial distance with, among those plants. First, uh, our findings 
showed that intrinsic and extrinsic plant attributes actually influence the structure of the individual pollination network and its reproductive output. In this case, the female reproductive success. Therefore, we provide novel insights into the functional consequences of the context dependence of plant pollinator interactions. Second, uh, we, our results uh, provide important, show important implications, may have important implications for the persistence and dynamics of animal pollinated plant population, especially under a, a global exchange scenario where the ecological context of individual plants is uh, very likely to change. Therefore, we propose a new modeling approach to assess and predict the potential consequences of plant pollinator interactions for individual and population performance. I would like to thank uh, Pedro Jordanes Lab for the uh, encouraging comments and helpful suggestions during the um, performance of this study and the Consejo Superior de Investigaciones Científicas in Spain for the financial support. Thank you. Yeah. 
it will be ready soon. Yeah, because I think it is, this is very interesting when you talk about it at the end. You know, maybe this is a way that we could explore the effects of global change. Mm -hmm. One way to explore is to see if we have some individuals in the population that are responding to the idea of occupying such a disrupted, some different niche than the rest of the population. Mm -hmm. This is a fascinating subject, which is not my specialty, it's Mars to Adam, which is said yeah, in the department, he's brilliant, by the way. But is this, uh, is it? Sorry, my study. <laughs>
what, what's the difference in that uh, point down there in the bike? This. In the Unipertec, yeah? Uh -huh. What's the special about that one? A lot of flowers. A lot of flowers. Yes. This, uh, the amount of flower increased uh, if the, the female fitness. The total number of flowers, yeah. but that's not significant, right? No, because which one? Total number of flowers. Ah, because this is another analysis. Mm -hmm. Here, here, this is a, a significant oh, association between the the female fitness and the flower and the number. <coughs>